This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Please rise in body or spirit and join me in the call to worship printed in your bulletin. We have been raised with Christ. We seek the things that are beyond us, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. We set your minds on heavenly things, not on earthly things. We have died with you, and our lives are hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our very heartbeat, is revealed, we also will be revealed with Christ in glory.
please be seated. Jesus said, Come to me, all of you who labor and are heavy burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your soul. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Let us rest in God's mercy as we confess first in silence. And now together. We went to the tomb because we thought you would be so dead. We did not believe you would really come back. We stayed back because we were afraid you would be confused. We told the women they were full of nonsense. We had to see that with our own eyes. Even the sight of the empty tomb did not convince us. We confess our doubts. We confess our disbelief. We confess our fears. We confess our dismal, we confess our dismissal of you, even when your presence is clear. On this Easter Sunday, I bring you good news. You are forgiven. You are made new. Everything you've left done or undone, the things you have forgotten to say, the things you wish you hadn't, all of those things are forgiven here and now as we remember the grace of God that meets us here. Hear now the sound of your baptism this morning. Thanks be to God. May you continue that grace in the way that you greet each other right now in this place by saying the peace of Christ be with you and also with you. Go and do likewise. Peace, shalom. Peace, everybody. Peace be with you. Yes, peace be with you. Happy Easter. Peace, happy Easter. Happy Easter. <laughs> You start five, and there's, I'll spend, spend one, 
Peace, everybody. And also to you. Peace. Peace. To Jim Schumer. No, no, to Jim. Off a local church. Yeah. Oh, got out of bed. Well, at least there are I'm some people there. Eight now on this thing. Okay. Uh, McConnell, Mitchell, Norris, Bill Ryan, Bill Ruby. That's a goodly crowd. That's a good crowd. That's a good crowd. Yeah. There's our friend. Yeah, they're all up there. Um, is there somewhere? Oh, I'm sure in the crowd. <coughs> Good morning. Good morning and welcome to Brown Memorial. My name is Pastor Michelle. I am so glad that you are here with us this Easter Sunday. If you are visiting today, I would like to give you a warm welcome. We are so glad you are here. Whether you are online with us or you are here in this place, I hope that you will feel the presence of God and the power of the love in this community while you are here. We invite you to fill out a contact card, which you can find in your pew, if you would like to be contacted by a pastor or a deacon, or would like to be on our mailing list. We would love to keep in touch with you. Masking is optional, including while singing, so we ask that you respect everyone's choice for what is best for themselves and their families. To stay informed about everything happening at Brown Memorial, I encourage you to review the back of your bulletin, to look at the announcements and the prayers. There are a number of events happening in the weeks to come. And please join us for refreshments in the assembly room this direction. We have coffee and treats for everyone, so please come and partake and 
get to know each other a little bit more today. We will begin our new Christian education series for the month of April next week with Brown Memorial member Taylor Branch leading a series called Race in American History. For the next three Sundays, he will preview his forthcoming book, offering ideas and selected stories at the intersection of memory, faith, violence, and democracy. For our community, we pray for Robert Gorham, who had back surgery this past Friday. He is recovering well at Union Memorial Hospital. We celebrate the birth of and pray for Hazel Collins Finney, Red Finney and Jenny Reed's first child. Baby Hazel is currently in the NICU after a difficult delivery early this week. I'd now like to invite the young and young at heart to come join Pastor Andrew here at the front. Come on down, everyone. Good morning, friends. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Make room. If we need to sit in two rows, we can two rows. Whatever works. Come on up. Find a good spot. I'm so glad to see you all. I got to see a lot of you guys yesterday at the Easter egg hunt. That was so fun. And for those of you I didn't get to see, I'm glad to see you this morning. So... I'm coming home, and I'm wondering if anybody does this when, when they come home. Okay, here's, let's imagine, here's the front door, and I'm walking in the front door. Does anybody do that when you get home? You do that? Oh, you do that? And, and you just drop your things, and you leave them, and probably not where they belong, right? But that's the place where you left them when you got home, right? So the story, in the story today, the uh, women leave Jesus' body at the tomb. At the tomb, which is like a graveyard. It's like a place where they bury his body because they think that's the place where Jesus' body is supposed to go. And they leave it there, and they leave it there, and they go home. And then they come back, and it's not there anymore. Someone or something... Do you ever, when you get to your house and you drop your things, you come back later and someone's picked them up and put them? And where do they put the, where do they put the things? Where do they put the things? Where do you find it? If there's in the middle of the floor where you left it. In the laundry room, where, okay, in, in the laundry room, what about for you? You don't really find it? It just, it, you never find it again? Okay, <laughs> Hazel. You find it on the hooks where it belongs, right? So guess what? The women go to the tomb and discover that Jesus doesn't belong in the graveyard. Jesus doesn't belong in the tomb. In fact, these sort of like angel people say, why, that's right, angel people, why do you, why do you look for the living, why do you look for the living among the dead? In other words, they're saying to the women at the tomb, Jesus doesn't belong here. He belongs with the living. He belongs with the living, with God, but also with the living, which means if you have eyes to see, Jesus is wherever there is life. In fact, He's with us today. He's with us today in this service. He's with anywhere healing is being done, anywhere love is happening. Yes. He, you can think about him as a ghost, because yeah, you might not see him the way that you think you might see him, 
but he's here with us. In fact, the Bible says every time two or more people get together to be in prayer together, Jesus is with them. So I want you to think about that this week. The good news about Easter is that God is with us in our living. God is with us everywhere where there is life. You guys had a couple thoughts. Let me hear them. I'm interested. Yes, that's right. It is, that is something special. Easter is the way we celebrate Jesus coming back from the dead. And what was your thought, Flora? He, Jesus came back alive on Easter, but what? A different year. Right, so you're thinking about the story when it happened in the world and how that connects to the story as, as we're telling it today. I love those thoughts. All right, so that's the, the end of our time together. You can either, after we pray together, you can either go sit with whoever's taking care of you today if you want to stay in the service, or go to the nursery today because I think there are fun things happening there too. So I'm going to say a prayer. Thank you all for your good thoughts, and happy Easter to each of you. Loving God, thank you for teaching us that you are with the living. Wherever there is life, we can find you. Help us remember this good news today. In your name we pray, amen. Thanks, everybody. Let us pray. Living God, help us so to hear your word that we may truly understand, that understanding we may believe, and believing we may follow your way in all faithfulness, seeking your honor and glory in all that we do. Amen. The Gospel reading is from Luke 23:50. Now there was a good and righteous man named Joseph who, though a member of the council, had not agreed to their plan and action. He came from the Jewish town of Arimathea, and he was waiting expectantly for the kingdom of God. This man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then he took it down wrapped it in a linen cloth, and laid it in a rock-hewn tomb where no one had ever been laid. It was the day of preparation, and the Sabbath was beginning. The women who had come with him from Galilee followed, and they saw the tomb and how his body was laid. Then they returned and prepared spices and ointments. On the Sabbath, they rested according to the commandment. But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they went to the tomb, taking the spices that had been prepared. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they went in, they did not find the body. While they were perplexed about this, suddenly two men in dazzling clothes stood beside them. The women were terrified and bowed their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, 
Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must must be handed over to sinners and be crucified and on the third day rise again. Then they remembered his words. And returning from the tomb, they told all this to the eleven and the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the other women with them who told this to the apostles. But these words seemed to them an idle tale, and they did not believe them. But Peter got up and ran to the tomb, Stooping and looking in, he saw the linen cloths by themselves. Then he went home, amazed at what had happened. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Please pray with me. O God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. You do remember the story, right? Crucifixion, death, three days in the tomb, followed by the resurrection. If you haven't learned it by now, I'm really concerned about you. We do this every year, even did it during COVID. We get together and tell the same story the church has been telling for a couple thousand of years. Even if you haven't been here or in any church ever, the story's been so ingrained in the culture by now that it kind of makes you wonder if it's really necessary for us to go through the motions at all. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Let's all get on to brunch. No one is going to forget the resurrection story. Yet forgetting the resurrection story is what Luke's gospel seems most concerned about. Remember, say those two classy dressed angel types at the tomb, how he told you that the Son of Man must be handed over to sinners and be crucified and on the third day rise again. Remember, apparently the women, like all the rest of the disciples, have terrible memories. Even though Jesus told them about his death and resurrection at least three different times according to Luke's gospel. The Son of Man will be handed over to the Gentiles, and he will be mocked and insulted and spat upon. After they have flogged him, they will kill him, and on the third day, he will rise again. These aren't hints. These aren't ambiguous innuendos. Jesus was clear and direct, so how could they have forgotten? I guess that unlike us, none of the disciples in the story, including these first female witnesses, none of them had 2,000 years of cultural history to bring resurrection immediately to mind. Since the resurrection wasn't a holiday that they celebrated every year, I guess it is possible that they just plain forgot. But also, unlike us, they had heard that this would happen from the lips of Jesus himself. Remember how he told you? Remember how he told y'all, which is the more accurate translation from the Greek? And how could anyone forget such a significant prediction made on three separate occasions when everything else about that prediction, the handing over to the Gentiles, the mocking and the insulting and the spitting and the flogging and the killing had all just happened. How could you forget Jesus himself predicting his own death and resurrection and not come back to that tomb with at least a tiny nugget of hope, however small, that it just might happen. 
Even if you were skeptical about resurrection, how could you not even mention it to your fellow disciples? Hey, I know this sounds crazy, but remember how Jesus told us after the convicting and the mocking and the beating and the killing that he would rise from the dead? Anybody else remember that? I don't find it credible at this point in the story that they would have forgotten something as significant as this, which makes me wonder if Luke has something else in mind when it comes to remembering. Something more than or other than just content recall. We have learned a lot about our, how our memory works since the time of Jesus. It's not a singular mechanism. It's a batch of systems that are working together. And cognitive science distinguishes between two kinds of memory functions. A declarative memory that is used to retrieve specific information from the past and a more procedural memory that is content free when it comes to conscious memory retrieval. It's the second memory function that is responsible for all kinds of actions that we take without being conscious of the content of the memories that produce the actions themselves. Take driving, for example. When you get in a car to drive, your brain is relying on past experiences without consciously recalling any of those actual experiences. Or when you play an instrument, your brain is relying on those past experiences without your conscious awareness of any of the content of those previous practice sessions. And as is probably obvious to some of you, this procedural memory system is way more powerful than the declarative one. It's this system that makes your responses to other people in the world fairly autonomous, running whatever scripts and programs that got wired into yourself, many of which were based on experiences so early in your development that you were never conscious of them at all. The strength of this memory system is that it operates mostly at the unconscious level, and this is what also makes it so difficult to change. So if you're a people-pleasing person, for example, who wants to be more assertive, you can't just decide one day, I think I'll decide to be more assertive. You've got to go through the painful process of digging out that code that makes you feel safest or happiest or best love through your people-pleasing work and to rewire that over time. Or if you're an anxious person who has trouble feeling comfortable in public situations, you can't just reason your way into deciding to feel a different way. You've got to get at that deeper memory system that keeps you on your anxious autopilot even when you know you want to be flying free on your own. Or if you're a racially prejudiced person, the classic example I have witnessed, is being the only white person on a team made up of people of color meeting with another white person who only makes eye contact with me. If you want to change any of these ways of living in the world, you've got to get to that deeper procedural memory that keeps you doing the same things that you don't want to be doing, living the same ways you don't want to be living, repeating the same behaviors you don't want to be repeating. Like disciples, who know the content of what Jesus told them about resurrection, but have been wired to live as though it were not possible. I think that's the sort of memory that Luke is getting at. Surely the women at the tomb and the disciples behind closed doors and those two disciples we'll hear about in a couple of weeks on the road to Emmaus, surely they all remember Jesus' words about resurrection. 
Someone telling you about resurrection is not something you would forget. Someone predicting their own resurrection is most certainly not something you would forget. But because resurrection is not part of your basic procedural memory, not part of your normal ways of living, not part of the assumptions that undergird your way of being in the world, it's not going to impact your behavior in any meaningful way. Which is exactly what Luke is worried about in the early church. Worried about Jesus' followers retreating back to the scripts that ran their lives before they met Jesus. The scripts telling them that Caesar does have the last word, that the healing that God promises can only be taken so far, that women disciples aren't a real thing, that hope eventually does run out, that the rich are eventually winners who take all, that the first shall be first and might makes right. That's basically the world's script without resurrection, without the unexpected overturning of what we currently know as possible. We're pretty much to, destined to be a nation that never passes any significant, meaningful gun safety legislation destined for something like more than 600 mass shootings a year, our current average. Without the unexpected overturning of what we currently know as possible, we are locked into running those old racist scripts that repeat police brutality against black bodies or racial disenfranchisement of black voters and black legislators from Nashville on down or the redlining scripts of the past that continue to play themselves out in the disparities of wealth and health present this very day in our city's neighborhoods. Without the unexpected overturning of what we currently know as possible, we'll basically lose the planet to the coming climate catastrophe. The difficult part of this story is that all of these outcomes are more likely than not without resurrection to interrupt what is possible. And resurrection by its very definition is more unlikely than not. How do we access this alternative procedural memory when, like his closest disciples, it is so much easier to let those automated scripts program us to accept death as the only possible outcome of our best hopes to go home, lock the doors, and hide from its inevitability. I don't know. What I notice, what I notice is that none of those first participants in resurrection-related activities are themselves conscious of the possible impact of their actions. Joseph of Arimathea hasn't said anything about resurrection. He's just doing a decent thing doing a decent thing and a risky one by going to Pilate and getting permission to bury Jesus' body before sundown. Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the other women with them are not expecting Jesus to find Jesus resurrected from the dead. They're doing a decent thing and a risky one by tending to his broken body. God is the only one doing the most difficult lifting of making possible what was unlikely before. All they have to do is show up and find out how their meager efforts might translate into a much deeper impact than what they had first imagined. 
Look at, look at Joseph when he took down the body of Jesus, wrapped it in a linen cloth. Listen, wrapped it in a linen cloth and laid it in a rock-hewn tomb where no one had ever been laid. I don't think he had any clue that taking the body, wrapping it in cloth, and laying it down is what Jesus' mother Mary did when he was born. Do you remember? Taking his body, wrapping it in swaddling clothes and cloths and laying it in a manger. Joseph had no idea he was preparing Jesus, not for death, but for life. The women at the tomb had no idea they were preparing to be the very first preachers in the history of the church. Proclaiming the truth of God's powerful love over death, nor did they know that they would be the first but not the last to have their amazing proclamation declared BS, which is what the word for the more sanitized translation, idle tale, actually means. The mansplained experience that most women I know have had chosen by God as the barometer for how you know you are really proclaiming resurrection. When you hit that nerve that generates the status quo protective reaction, you know you're getting close to preaching resurrection. All these people did was show up without any conscious choice to believe in resurrection or to preach it or enactment. In, in fact, the only choices that it seemed like they made were to show up as decent people, open to being surprised by, corrected by, used by, steered by God. Brian McLaren calls Easter the start of the uprising, and this is exactly the way uprisings begin. People show up as decent people with no idea of the impact that's even possible, open to participating with hope and finding out where it will lead them. Students who show up as decent people in the legislative house in Nashville, preparing to be used by hope with no idea of where it's going to lead. Many of you who showed up on the doorsteps of some of our, our newest immigrant neighbors with nothing more than an openness to meeting the presence of God in our newest neighbors. Some of you who are preparing to show up and teach our kids in the fall or serving in the leadership of our church or befriending the most recent sojourner to the very front doors of the church or standing together with other people of faith that build actions with no sense of whether your presence will mean anything to anybody. This is how the uprising of God's way of love and justice in the world begins, not necessarily with people who already believe in the resurrection, although that never hurts, <laughs> but people who saw how radical Jesus' ways of loving yourself and others all the way down to your roots could be for yourself and for the world and show up just wanting to be a part of that. And despite 2,000 years of telling this story, I know our world hasn't learned it beyond the declarative content recall level. We still operate as though hope is dead, retaliation is the right way to justice, war is what we have to settle for, despair is what we have to expect. We desperately need to go through the motions of our Easter story each and every year. No, make that each and every week so we can rewrite our public and private scripts that leave too many of us acting as though the world or we cannot change, as though none of our efforts make a difference, as though Caesar does have the last word, 
so that the healing that God promises can only be taken so far that women disciples aren't a real thing, that hope eventually runs out, that the rich are eventually the winners who take all, that the first will be first, and might makes right. We need to remember. Remember, resurrection is not only possible, it is promised by the God who is in the business of rewriting those old automatic scripts of hopelessness with alternative programming of hope, scripts of peace, and narratives of justice. Remember at the deepest levels possible so that wherever death is most present, wherever hope is most out of reach, wherever fear is most palpable, palpable, we too can show up with little more than a desire to be decent people open to the possibility of a just and a healing future. The good news, the good news from the state house in Nashville to the streets of the city, from the rooms in the ICU to the front doors of the church, from whatever ending seems untraversable, the good news is that God is the one who does the heavy lifting. Remember how he told y'all? Remember how he told y'all? You may be seated. At Easter, we participate in the one great hour of sharing, which is a Presbyterian Church special offering. Your gift to one great hour of sharing provides a way for those whose lives have been affected. 
by poverty, hunger, or disaster, whether natural or human caused, to begin to repair the lives of their families and communities. Our work is informed by our belief that the capital C Church is not an institution, but an action. For the church to be the church, it must take action to be with those in need. For over 70 years, One Great Hour of Sharing has provided a way to share God's love with our neighbors in need around the world. As you may have heard before, when we all do a little, it adds up to a lot. This morning you may give to the One Great Hour of Sharing special offering by placing cash or check in the designated envelope in your bulletin. Regular offerings may also be made by cash or check. Place both in the offering plate as it comes around. You may also use the QR code printed in your bulletin. Thank you for giving what you can.
Please join your hearts with me in prayer. Restoring God, you have called us to repair what has been broken in this world you love so much. May the repairs made through our gifts bring life to communities in need and bring praise to your holy name. Amen. You may be seated. Communion today is by intention, and when directed by the ushers, you'll just come up to the front and take a piece of bread, dip it in the cup, eat it, and make your way back to your seat. And the elements today are gluten-free and non-alcoholic. Virtual worshipers, you're welcome to join with us in sharing from home. And this is not a Presbyterian table, this is the Lord's table, and the Lord invites all who wish to feast. Can to come and join him here. At this table, we remember Jesus Christ. At this table, we rejoice in his resurrection. At this table, we recognize ourselves in the disciples. At this table, we revel in God's love for us. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks for the Lord our God. It is, truly, it is truly right and our greatest joy to give you thanks and praise, eternal God. At your word, the earth was made and spun on its course. Your hand formed us from the earth and set us among all your creatures to love and serve you. When we were unfaithful to you, you kept faith with us. Your love remained steadfast. When we were enslaved, you broke the bonds of our oppression, brought us to freedom, and made a covenant to be our God. You led us through the desert and set before us the way of life. You spoke of love and justice in the prophets, and in the word made flesh, you lived among us, manifesting your glory. He died that we might live and is risen to raise us to new life. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the faithful of every time and place who forever sing to the glory of your name. holy, O God of majesty, and blessed is Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, whom you sent to save us. By your power he broke free from the prison of the tomb, and at his command the gates of hell were opened. The one who was dead now lives. The one who humbled himself is raised to rule over all creation, the Lamb upon the throne. The one ascended on high is with us always as he promised. Great is the mystery of faith.
pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these your gifts of bread and wine, that the bread we break and the cup we bless may be the communion of the body and blood of Christ. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, that we, that we may be one with all who share this feast, united in ministry in every time and place. As this bread is Christ's body for us, send us out to be the body of Christ in the world. We trust that God knows all our needs, the needs of our community, the needs of our city, nation, and world, the needs that we have named this morning, and the needs that remain unnamed but very present on our hearts. Let us join our voices together now in the prayer that Jesus taught us, sitting together, our Mother who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. On the night before he showed us the full extent of his love, Jesus took a loaf of bread and he broke it and he gave it to his disciples and he said, take and eat. This is my body broken for you. Every time you eat this bread, you do so remembering me. In the same way he took the cup, and he said, this is the cup of the new covenant, sealed in my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this remembering me. Remembering all your mighty and merciful acts, we take this bread and this wine from the gifts you have given to us, and celebrate with joy the redemption won for us in Jesus Christ. This is the Lord's table. Every time you eat of this bread and drink of this cup, you remember our risen Lord until he comes again. Our Savior invites those who trust him to share the feast which he has prepared. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
Have all who wish to be served received communion? If so, then please join your hearts with me as we pray. Nourished at this table, O God, may we know Christ's redemptive love and live a new life in him. Help us who recognize our Lord in the breaking of bread to see and serve him in all whose lives are broken. Give us who are fed at his hand grace to share our bread with the hungry and with the hungry of heart. Keep us faithful in your service until Christ comes in final victory, and we shall feast with all your saints in the joy of your eternal realm. Through Christ, all glory and honor are yours, almighty God, with the Holy Spirit and the Holy Church, now and forever. Amen.
Siblings in Christ, leave this place and do not forget. Do not forget. Remember how he told you. Remember how He told y'all. And as you do, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you and among you and between you this and every day of your gifted life.